I'm really excited um, today that we have Sister Ignatia with us from the Sisters of St. Francis of Perpetual Adoration. Um, these sisters are in primarily in Indiana and Illinois, which I'm excited about because I'm from Indiana myself, even though I live in Kansas. Um, these sisters serve in my home diocese in my town and where my, so my children were born, and they're just fantastic. They have the heart of Jesus and a heart for the church. Um, something that's different about these sisters than the cloistered poor Claire's that we talked to last week is that these sisters live a life of prayer and community and also apostolate. So they do a lot of work in education and healthcare and in works of mercy. Um, so they live a balanced life of prayer, especially prayer in front of Eucharist um, Sisters of St. Francis of Perpetual Adoration. So you know that um, Eucharistic Adoration is a big part of their charism, and then also caring for the church in education and in healthcare. So Sister Ignatia is their vocation director, um, and she's going to share with us a little bit about herself and her vocation story and her sisters. So welcome, Sister Ignatia. Hi, thanks for having me. So glad to have you. So could you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and maybe how you discovered that you were called to be a sister, a bride of Christ, and what that looked like as you were growing up and discerning your vocation? Sure. Um, so I I am originally from uh, upstate New York, a little town called Mexico um, with two stoplights and no sisters. So I didn't meet sisters when I was little. Um, I didn't go to Catholic school, but my family was very, um, very faithful. We went to mass every Sunday. We prayed together every night. Um, and I remember my parents always giving me a blessing before I went to bed. Um, so I'm not sure if any of uh, you all do that before you like send your kids to bed, but, um, maybe when I was older, uh, in high school, I didn't appreciate it as much. You know, you might get a little annoyed about that, that, but, um, looking back, I realized how many graces uh, the Lord was giving me and um, the blessings that the Lord was giving me through that. Um, so after high school, when I was thinking about going to college, I really wanted to go to a Catholic school because I hadn't experienced it and I really wanted to be formed in my faith. So I went to a Catholic university and um, there I met sisters for the first time. Um, and so I was really reminded about like when I was little, um, I had thought, you know, I had saw movies and read books about uh, sisters and I didn't realize people still did that. Um, so then when I was at school, um, uh, I saw sisters who were not much older than me, um, who really like dedicated their life to Jesus. And so uh, that really made an impression on me. So I started spending time with the sisters uh, one of the sisters, so one of, uh, there are a few communities at this university where I was studying, um, but one of our sisters from the community I'm in, she was helping out with our basketball team. So I was on the basketball team and, um, she just like do donated her time. She had played basketball, was a coach, um, and then just helped out. And so that made a big impression on me because at first I thought, um, I saw all these sisters and I thought, wow, that's amazing. People still do that. Um, but it can't be any fun and they must like have to become somebody else in order to be a sister because you have to be kind of like perfect and do all these things. Um, so it was until I like met her and spent time with her, we would uh, just like shoot around. And then I realized like, oh, she's still herself. Um, she's really joyful and yet she's given up everything to be a uh, bride of praise. So just starting asking a lot of questions. Um, I visited the mother house uh, during my time in school, and I realized the the joy that I saw in the sisters that I was spending time with on campus um, was with all the sisters uh, in the in the mother house, and then making that realization that um, Jesus in the Eucharist was the center of their life and the source of all of their joy. Um, so I was really feeling that um, tug pretty strongly. And so in college is kind of the time when people think that you should find out what you should do with, with the rest of your life. Um, and I couldn't figure it out. I wasn't really sure. Um, but once I started praying a little more and, um, spending time with the sisters, 
I was realizing that this life that I was experiencing, um, this like religious life dedicated to Jesus, I realized that that was, that was what I was supposed to do with the rest of my life. Um, and that was going to make me the most myself and happy. Um, so after my sophomore year in college, um, I had visited the sisters a few times at the mother house and, um, discerned that that was really the time that Jesus was calling me to enter. So then, then at that point, after my sophomore year, that kind of started our formation process. So we can get into that, but that takes time before you really commit yourself uh, to Jesus forever. So, yeah. That's wonderful, sister. Can you tell us a little bit about your community um, and like what kinds of things you do, maybe what your life looks like, but maybe also what about your community really attracted you and made you think, I know Jesus wants me to be a part of this community. Um, yeah, I think that can be confusing when people are discerning anything, but also religious life, because you think there's so many, there's so many communities out there. Um, but these sisters were, um, so the sisters in St. Francis of Professional Adoration were really the sisters that the Lord like put in my, the path of my, my daily life, just like, um, and so I guess what makes us stand out, I guess, so our, our charism, if um that word is like ringing a bell so charism really means a gift so a gift of the holy spirit that um was given to a founder to found a community as a gift to the church to really be a witness in the church and um so our gift um is is perpetual adoration um with the spirituality of saint francis so we have a perpetual adoration chapel where jesus is exposed in the monstrance 24 7 so he's there um, in the center of our of our home and our sisters take turns spending time with him day and night. Um, so that really like forms um, each of our sisters and also our community and our family spirit. So um, I think that is what I can could kind of sense when I was spending time with the sisters. I could sense the um the fruit of spending time with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament and what that really did for them and um so I guess yeah just like that the joy the family spirit um the spirituality of adoration really you know I don't know if you all have been to adoration but sometimes you wonder like there's not a whole lot to do sometimes right you're just kind of sitting there and looking at Jesus and Jesus is there looking at you and actually, that's all you really need to do sometimes. Um, that Jesus, He's in the Eucharist so that you can that He can be with you. Um, so I think in adoration, like learning that, just knowing that it's good to just be with Jesus. It's just good to be with Him. Um, so when I was realizing that that these sisters stood out to me because I would meet other sisters, but um, if they didn't have perpetual adoration, which not many other sisters do. Um, I, I wasn't interested. I was like, oh, I actually really want to have Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament all the time. Um, so that was something that Jesus put on my heart that, um, yeah, to kind of help, you know, help direct me to like the, that family that he had in mind for me. Um, so yeah. And then we also say like when you discern and when you visit, you always have to visit someplace. And then there's kind of the sense of like, at home that you're comfortable you know I'm sure you all are comfortable in your own home with your siblings with your parents like it's a, a place where you're you feel free and at rest and um so that is a similar feeling that we have when we come and visit um our community too um so a little bit so with, uh perpetual adoration is our charism and then from our time in front of Jesus in the blessed sacrament comes all of our like works of mercy so we spend time with Jesus to love him and to be loved by him. And then we take that love out into the world um, through our apostolates of like uh, healthcare and education. So we try to just bring Jesus that all the love that he gives us. And we try to share that with other people um, in those ways. And then bringing back to Jesus in the Eucharist, all those intentions that were given um, and difficulties people are going through, blessings, all that we experience during the day and bringing that back to our time of adoration. I think something that's really cool about your order, Sister Ignatia, is that 
um, for a kid who maybe is thinking about what they want to do when they grow up, um, like probably many of them think maybe I want to be a teacher when I grow up, or maybe I want to be a nurse or a doctor or work in healthcare or, or with um, young children, that you can be called to that as a sister, that your life is a life of prayer, but also this life of service in professions that lots of people want to do. Um, how does that work for your community? Do people come in and they're already teachers or already doctors and nurses, or do they get to learn how to do those as a part of your community? Kind of depends um, which, uh, wherever the sister is, like wherever she is in her discernment. Some people are discern early on, some people a little later. And then it depends on like what the sister's gifts are and then what the needs of the community are. Um, so we say like the charism is the thing that's kind of an um, essential and non-negotiable. Like that has to be in us um, to live our charism. And then the apostolate is something that we have to just kind of be able to do. Um, so it's it's a little different than having like the dream of being a nurse or something like, yes, that can really fit in our community, but it's like the secondary thing. So we've had sisters that started out as nurses and moved into something completely different. Um, so I guess how that works when a young woman kind of enters, she really spends the first few years just focusing on what it means to be a sister and not on any like active apostolate at all. And then as that like first few years of formation happens, um, towards the end of that, then that sister is talking to the, the mother superior and they're talking about okay what what background she has what education she has what gifts she has what the needs of the community are and how those two things can kind of come together um how they can like kind of fit um so then at the end of the day the sister is asked to fulfill you know some role by the mother superior so it's out of an obedience so we take a vow of obedience to make sure that we know um I know that when I'm asked to do something in obedience, that I'm doing God's will for me. And then I'm going to actually be fulfilled and be happy and free. Um, so often, yeah, if a sister has is a registered nurse, most likely she will be serving as a registered nurse. Um, but then she also might be doing some other things in the hospital, like visiting patients or educating our employees on what it means to be Catholic or stuff like that. Um, yeah, so I guess kind of both and. I don't know if that kind of gets at like what you're asking. Um, yeah. I yeah. think that's great. I think it's good for all of us to yeah, learn that that discernment process doesn't just end when you enter a community, but it's a discernment throughout your whole vocation of what God wants of you. Um, I would love to hear from our friends in the clubhouse, what questions do you guys have for Sister Ignatia? And if you were on a vocations call before, if you wanna think about some of those questions that maybe were asked that you thought had really fun answers or that maybe was a question that you didn't get to ask before um, about her discernment or her community or her work, what questions do we have today for Sister Ignatia? Let's see, Bernadette, can you turn your mic on? So you can ask your question. Awesome. Um, how long do you spend in adoration every day? Well, that's a good question. Um, so it depends. So in um, about, we say about four hours in a day that we're praying. So when you think of like Eucharistic adoration going for a holy hour, I have probably about um, one of those with all of us together in the big chapel. And then I usually have another one like by myself in our little adoration chapel or spread out throughout the day. Um, so like one to two hours of adoration. And then we have a, a couple other hours of prayer where we have mass and then we have um, uh, other like quiet prayer and then um, the liturgy of the hours also in our main chapel. So, so about probably two hours of like that quiet, like spending time with Jesus in adoration. Yeah. We've got some great questions in the chat right now. Oh. The Johnson family wants to know, what does your daily schedule look like? Um, and that could be a general daily schedule for any sister that's in your order or you specifically too with the postulate that you have. Yeah. 
uh, it's kind of handy that for a lot of us, the the most important things in our schedule are pretty much the same across across the board. So we usually will start the day with prayer and we'll end the day with prayer. Um, so for some of us, usually our day starts in the middle of the night. So it'll start, we've gone to bed and then we will wake up in the middle of the night. Like I had 1.30 adoration last night. So I woke up um, in time enough to get to chapel and pray for an hour. And then I went to back to bed. Um, so then I, and then I get up again, you know, at, um, in the morning to get to chapel in the morning. So usually the day starts in the middle of the night in the little hours of the morning, um, uh, spending time with Jesus, go to bed and then we get up. And so then, um, the usual day kind of starts in our main chapel with quiet prayer during um, the weekdays, our, we're in chapel by about 5.30 in the morning, and then we start with prayer, and then we pray the liturgy of the hours, so it's like the psalms that we're, what we're chanting back and forth, and then we um, have the holy sacrifice of the mass all together, so we have a chaplain priest who comes and celebrates mass for us every day, which is wonderful, and then after that, we have breakfast, um, and then at that point, that's kind of when the sisters who might have go to a school to teach during the day or a hospital to serve, that's then we kind of like part ways a little bit to kind of do what our apostolates are. And then we'll come back together in the evening at try to about 4.30 to maybe do some spiritual reading. So read about like a saint, about um, anything about the spiritual life. And then at five o'clock, we start our um, community holy hour. So we're in front of Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament all together. And during that time, we will pray rosary, we'll pray liturgy of the hours again, and then we will um, end with benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. So think about it, we get to see Jesus a lot and get blessed, be blessed by him a lot during the day, which is really amazing. Um, so then after our holy hour at night, um, we will we eat together, and then we also have some recreation together. So um, we talk during our meals. So some communities might not talk during their meals just because of their own like spirituality. Um, and so we'll talk and that's kind of when we can share about our day. And then we have recreation. So we'll play games, card games, um, anything. <laughs> and then we'll end with night prayer and then we will uh, go to bed, hopefully a little early so we can get up and be awake during moderation. Yeah. And sister, when you go do your apostolate, the Farrell family wants to know what's your apostolate. So my apostolate, um, it changed a little bit this summer. So I am still the vocation director. So that means I help um, young women who are thinking about becoming a sister. And if they want to become um, a sister in our community, I kind of walk with them through that discernment process. Um, but then I also am now the novice directress. So that means the sisters who are just starting out as sisters, they spend more time in prayer and taking classes about being a sister. So then I spend my time with them and I, I teach some classes with them. I help just help guide them in like what it means to be a sister of St. Francis of Perpetual Adoration. So during my day, um, I'm usually at the mother house. I stay here. Um, I might teach a few classes. I'm also responsible for the mother house chapel. So I'll um, clean up after mass, reset, get things ready for benediction, all of those things. Um, and then little odds and ends around the mother house because it's a big house and a big family and things come up. So, you know, I might just help a sister with whatever she has to do that day, um, chores around the house, stuff like that. Yeah, good question. Awesome. Gabby and Sammy, do you want to turn your um, mic on, come off of mute and ask Sister Ignatia your question? Um, what is your favorite prayer to pray? My favorite prayer to pray? That's a really good question. Um, you know, lately, have you, do you all play, pray litanies or have heard of like a litany before? It's a prayer where you repeat a lot of the same words and then you kind of go back and forth. So we pray those when we have benediction. So Jesus is out on the in the monstrance on the altar and we'll pray a litany together. And I really like um, this, um, the litany of the sacred heart and the litany of the holy name of Jesus. 
So I like about those is because you're saying like heart of Jesus over and over again. And then the litany of the Jesus is um, the holy name of Jesus. You're saying the name of Jesus over and over again. Um, I don't know. So that really, I guess, kind of is moving for me. And like, have you ever thought about just saying the name of Jesus is a prayer? Which is kind of amazing that his his name is really powerful. So I do like just treating his name like a prayer too. Good question. Gabby and Sammy, do you want me to answer your question in, in the chat box too? Is that okay? Yeah. You asked me what my favorite song was. Okay. Um, my favorite song is called Ave Verum. So it's it's a chant song, but it's about it's about Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament, and it's really beautiful. It's um just really simple and kind of like flows up and down. So it's kind of I like kind of songs like that. <laughs> Bernadette and, and George, do you have a question? I see your hand up. Do you want to turn your mic on? Um, how long have you been a nun? I have been a sister for 13 years. <laughs> I know. It goes by pretty quick. But it's been a lot of fun. Lucy, do you want to turn on your mic and ask your question? From the chat box. Mm -hmm. you know how <laughs> mm. how old do you have to be to join how old do you have to be so um the church has have you ever like there's church law to make sure you know that we don't want anyone doing something that they um regret or haven't thought about seriously so they're uh from the church it says that you have to be at least 18 so in a like in our in com like modern the world 18 is kind of when you're an adult and can make an adult decision. Um, so at least 18, but usually a young woman is a little older than that. Um, it helps to maybe have some experience, be go to college for a little while, um, kind of be able to really discern well that this is what you want to do with your life and that's what Jesus wants. So good question. Um, the Johnson family put a question for you, sister, in the chat box and it says, how do you celebrate feast days and birthdays? So how, what does that look like in your community? We, um, so we celebrate, our, our feast days are much bigger than our birthdays. So on our birthday, we do uh, sing to the sister for her birthday. We acknowledge that it is her birthday. And then we, uh, at the mother house, the intention for mass on her birthday is for her, which is a pretty great gift, I think. Um, but then on the feast day, that is when maybe a sister might get like a special treat, whatever, you know, her favorite dessert might be, um, cards from sisters wishing her a happy feast day. Um, because yeah, that is part of your consecration is like, you've, this patron is special to you is a gift, um, that there's some gift from that patron to you, you know, to live your life well. So we want to um, acknowledge that and celebrate that. Um, yeah. Awesome. Gabby, you want to turn your mic on and ask your question? Um, where's your favorite place, place to pray? Mm, my favorite place. Um, so my favorite place would be, well, first our Adoration Chapel. So, but I'll give you another one because that's kind of obvious maybe. Um, ooh, my next favorite at our mother house is actually, so we have, our buildings are pretty tall. We have one building that's four stories and you can actually get out onto the roof. So it's really exciting to go out onto the roof. It's safe. There's, there's walls. It's a safe place to be, but it's really cool to go out onto the roof, um, and then watch the sunrise and think about how like, wow, you know, God made that happen. He wanted that to happen. He didn't have to make it beautiful, but it is. And it's just really beautiful to be able to like watch it and just think about Jesus. So yeah, the roof at sunrise particularly, yeah. There's a great question in the chat here because I think maybe some kids are hungry. <laughs> when do you do dinner, sister? When you talked about your day and your schedule, when do the sisters eat? And maybe 
um, along with that, do you um, do you eat all of your meals in community? Um, yeah, so we're pretty, we do follow a pretty uh, set schedule. So we're usually eating dinner at about six o'clock every day. Um, and then we do eat most all of our meals together. Um, maybe like on Saturday, we kind of have like, we call it like private breakfast. So it's, it's a little more open-ended so you can have breakfast here and there, but every other meal we do eat around the table together, share a meal together. Yeah. In common. So do you have a question? I see your hand up. Do you want to unmute, turn your mic on and ask sister your question? And why? Could you repeat that for me? I'm sorry, I missed it. Okay. Paint and train paint and train. why? What did you ask us? Who's your patron saint? Oh. Why? Thanks, Bernadette. Sorry, I couldn't understand that. Patron saint. Okay, so my yeah. name is Sister Ignatia. It's not written out there, but um, Sister Ignatia, and that is for Saint Ignatius of Antioch. So Saint Ignatius is an early church martyr. Uh, so he died around the year like 104 and um, he was brought to Rome to die um, in, they're not sure if it was really the Colosseum or not, but basically to die in the Colosseum because he was such a great Christian and a bishop and very, um, a holy man. So they captured, the Romans captured him, brought him to Rome um, and he died by being eaten to death by lions which be kind of kind of intimidating to me, I think. Um, but why I, I felt really drawn to him particularly was because of his spirituality um, of the Eucharist. So he wrote letters before he died and he talks about how much he wanted to be like Jesus in the Eucharist and how much he wanted to just belong to Jesus. And so if that meant that he had to die a martyr to be with Jesus, then he was gonna he was okay with that. So, um, so I was really inspired by that. So Ignatia is just the feminine version of Ignatius. Thank you, sister. The Johnson family have sort of a question that um, builds on that, which is, um, so if the sisters choose new names, which it sounds like they do, and how are they chosen? What's the process for changing your name? And when do you get your new name? Is it when you show up at the door or do you get it later? Yeah, so um, our sisters, when you enter, you are a postulant and you aren't a sister. So you are you wear something different. You keep your you keep your name that your family gave you. And so you live as a postulant for, in our community now, you are a postulant for two years. And then you have discerned, okay, I, I'm really confident that Jesus has called me to this community and he wants me to be a sister and belong to him. Awesome. So then in that process, um, so before you become a sister, you submit a letter and you um, request to become a sister and you also list three name choices. And in those name choices, you kind of give the reasons um, when you would celebrate that name, um, et cetera. And uh, then those name choices are submitted to our mother superior and her council. And so those sisters then pray about that and they actually have the final kind of say about which name you receive. And then you don't find out that name until you receive the habit. And um, that is done in a, in a ceremony with just the sisters in the chapel. You, you take your habit, you leave chapel, you go get dressed, you come back. And then there's a few like uh, prayers and responses. And then that is when the mother superior says, you know, you will no longer be called such and such, but you will be called sister so-and-so. So it gets pretty exciting to find now, out. What's that like, sister? Do you feel nervous right before you get to hear your name? What What does that feel like? It's a little, it, it depends on the sister, but it, it, you're usually a little nervous and you're facing the all the sisters. So you do, you're like, I hope my reaction's okay. I don't want to like faint or anything. Anyway. Um, no one's fainted. It's been okay. But um, I think there's also part of like the Holy Spirit has already like put these names on your heart. So before you even get there, I think there is some kind of, you know, security and conviction of like what Jesus wants you to be called or like 
when you hear it, there is this like kind of sense of peace too that like, like, oh yeah, yeah, that's it. That's, that's uh, who I am. So yeah, it's a little nerve wracking and you're just like waiting for it to be said the whole time, but it's exciting when it, once it happens. <laughs> um, Gabby, we'll get to your question here in just a second, sweetheart. So don't worry, but there's a question that's in the chat box, two that kind of go together that I think are great. So for you, sister, what kind of food do you eat, you and your sisters? And then a question about how do you get money so that you can buy the food that you eat and also the things that you need? So how does that work for Franciscans? So for us, um, for what we eat, so at the mother house, we have a lot of people. So there's like uh, 60, 70 people here. So we have um, kind of food that's uh, prepared for us because it would take so many people to like make all that food. Um, and so we have kind of, it's kind of basic food. Like we'll have pizza sometimes, we'll have salad a lot, um, meat and potatoes, eggs for breakfast, cereal. Yeah, kind of some basic stuff. Fish sticks on Friday sometimes, fish patties. Anyway, so some basic things. Um, then how do we, oh, we do get ice cream on Sundays. So that's special. Um, so then how do we pay for that? So then our sisters who serve in an apostolate, they receive something that's called a stipend, which um, isn't quite the same as when you hear like your parents receive like a salary or a paycheck or something like that. So a stipend isn't quite the same um, because, but we still do like receive, you know, reimbursement for the service that we provide. So that money then goes to a big, like a big pot. And then, so then we share all of that in common. So then when we need something, then we pay for it out of, you know, that that big, big sum of money. Um, but like, if I were to need something different, like special, or like I had a, my, my shoes fell apart or something like that, then I'd ask permission to go and get something that I needed. And then the sisters, you know, would provide for that. Thank you. Question. Yeah. Gabby, you want to turn your mic on and ask us your question? Um, do you miss your life before you were um uh, a nun? Do I miss my life? Um, you know, not really. I mean, I miss my family. So, I mean, my family doesn't live here with me. I don't, I can only see them certain times of the year. Um, so I can see my family, like for, I go home for two weeks to see them and then they can come and visit me. So I do miss my family. Um, I am still very, very close with them. We keep in touch. I, I know what's kind of going on, but like, I'm not there. Um, so that's hard, but I don't necessarily miss my life because this is, yeah, the life I wanted, you know? Now that doesn't mean there's some days that are hard, you know, you kind of like have to do some things that you don't want to do sometimes. So some days I experience that too. And I'm like, you know, I wish I could just go somewhere by myself and not do all the things that I have to do. But it usually turns out much better when, you know, I decide like, well, God's called me to do this. So I'm going to do it and trust him. And then it usually turns out way better than I thought it would. So if that answers your question. Thanks, Gabby. Um, the Sibin or Sibin family, I'm sorry if I said that incorrectly. Do you want to turn your mic on and ask your question? How do you know if God is calling you to um, religious life? Good question. And I'm going to take a guess because I, I speak German. So I think your family is the Sibin family. That's very, that's very nice. Very German. I don't know if you have seven people in your family. That's what Sibin means. But anyway, um, uh, so how do you know? I know everyone wants to know that. So what well, um, discernment hack for all of you. I hear it all the time. I just wish God would tell me what he wanted me to do so I could do it. I would do what he wanted me to do. He just has to tell me. Okay. That's not how God works because God loves you. So when God, if you want God to tell you what to do just so that you'll do it, you want him to be like, uh an army commander like to manipulate and coerce you and that's not love and that's not how god works so god wants a relationship with you 
So he has a relationship with you first and foremost. Um, and then you start to figure out how God wants to love you. Like how, how has he made your heart to love? Um, so over time, you, you're attracted to certain things, you know, God speaks to you in the events of your life. And so then how do you know if you're supposed to belong to him in a particular way as his bride or um, maybe as a priest or as a religious brother? Um, you know, you kind of, you'll, you'll start to feel like attracted to it, like the way of life. You will feel drawn to it in a certain sense. And then you will feel like you become more yourself in this way of life. Um, yeah, you're able to love God more. It's, it becomes a little easier. Um, there's peace. Um, and maybe things that you're starting to leave behind to try to follow this way of life, um, you have the grace to do it. Like you're not actually interested in, you know, the friends you had in, like the what you were doing in college because this is so much better or you're not concerned with the job you had because with this life is so much better like you have the grace to kind of leave those things behind um and follow where he's leading you so so this sense of like other things were not enough was I guess a a theme for me like the the love of like one man and one family wasn't going to be enough because Jesus made my heart for him and for um, to care for all people so yeah those things do become evident but he's not gonna like tell you and make you do it yeah <laughs> that's really helpful sister um the feral family you want to turn your mic on and ask your question go ahead do you change your clothes every day yeah, i quit change my clothes so like this this stuff right here <laughs> yeah so I have, so this is called a habit. Have you heard that word before? Maybe, probably. Um, so I have a couple of these. Now we have clothes, underclothes on the inside, like a t-shirt and that sort of stuff that we do change every single day. So it's really good to change your clothes and wash them. So we wash your clothes too. But we have a couple habits. Um, so this, um, we usually keep one habit really, really nice for Sunday right? You wear your Sunday best on Sunday. It, it looks exactly the same as this right here, but we kind of don't wear it as often, so it doesn't get dirty. So um, this, um, our habit is kind of like three pieces. So there's a part like here, this is called a tunic. So it just looks like kind of like a long dress. It doesn't have much shape necessarily it's to it. Um, and that's um, a simple dress and it's brown to kind of, and it kind of reminds us of our vow of poverty that we live a simple life and then over that is this piece right here we it's connected by snaps it's kind of fun um so this is called a scapular so maybe some of you wear like those like a small brown scapular for our lady so this is just a large version of it and if you can see the whole thing it kind of looks like an apron to remind us that we are um in the service um of god and when we, uh, we have dressing prayers that we pray. So this is actually um, to remind us of, you know, when Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden light. So what he asks me to do is fitted for me and I can, I can do it. Um, so this is kind of like that yoke that he's sharing with me the, in the image of a scapular. And then also part of a habit is our veil. So just like, like our lady wears a veil, um, to show that she is consecrated and set apart for God. Um, a bride wears a veil on her wedding day to show that she belongs um, just to her husband and nobody else. But I get to wear my veil every single day, which is pretty cool. So um, it's a visible sign in the world to show that um, I belong to God in a special way. Um, yeah, so that was a long question to whether or not we like change, but I figured you might wanna know some of those things too. Is that okay? Thanks. Here, Mary and I have a question here about, um, I was remembering when you said that you met the sisters when one was playing basketball and helping out with basketball. Do sisters get to play basketball and sports? And 
if you do, what do you wear when you play sports? Fair question. Fair question. So um, I might not be able to play like outside and play sports the same amount of time that you all might be able to play, but we do get to play sports um, outside and then we play, well, we play games inside too, but when the weather is nice, um, especially in the summer, we have more of our sisters that come to the home to the mother house. So we'll have people enough to play. Wiffle ball was really popular this year. I don't know why, but wiffle ball, softball, uh, basketball. Yeah. And then we wear our habits. So um, it's not really constrictive. I mean, I can do most everything in it. Um, yeah, this is all, this is all I got. So I don't have anything else necessarily to like change into either, um, but it works. Yeah. Sister, Vanza Chamley, you want to turn on your mic and ask your question? Um, my aunt is a little sister and she doesn't show her hair at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you show some of it, is there a reason why? You know, that's a good question. So there's um like styles of veils, I guess. So a community kind of decides together like what it's going to look like. And um, so you could show some of your hair, it could show none of it. Um, so I think the main reason is it's just the simplicity of the design, I think. So this is based on like there's a a, a metal piece that goes in this frame that gives the shape right here. There's a metal piece that kind of fits to your head. Um, it doesn't hurt, don't worry. It's just like for, I can bend it so it like fits right here. And so it looks kind of like a headband. So a headband would hit your head kind of right, right here. So I think it's just a simple design that, okay, this is where it would land on my head. So we then comb our hair back to hide the rest of it and then cover, cover it from there. But other communities, yeah, I can like, have designed a veil to like cover everything and they make that work for them too. So kind of just depends. Question. There's another question in the chat box about if you can watch TV in your order, can you guys, like you, clearly you can use computers and, and the internet, which is different than the Cloistered Sisters we've talked to, but can you guys like watch TV and movies, listen to music? Yes, so we can can do all of those things. So we can watch TV, we can listen to music, we can watch movies. Um, I guess it just depends on, yeah, what like our, um, our our responsibilities and our duties, and then what's good for our soul too. So um, if I have time in a day, sitting down and just seeing what's on TV might not be the best use of my time or best for my soul. But if there's something that like, oh, all the sisters tonight decided, hey, like, let's watch a movie. Great. So we watched, we watched a movie last weekend together. And that was wonderful. Just like, it was delightful. Um, we laughed about it, talked about it. So that was like something that brought us together. Um, so I guess it just, yeah, depends on whether this is something that's good for, for my soul, for my time. Am I should I be taking time for prayer instead? And just, um, and then is this activity leading me toward God and my sisters, or is it um, something I'm using to like to isolate or to, you know, be on my own and um, something like that? Yeah. Thanks, sister. The boys in the Barch family or Barsh um, put a question in the chat for you back to the veils. Do you wear your veils at night or do you take them off while you sleep? We do, we do take them off when we sleep. So I do wear regular pajamas to bed. So just pajama pants, t-shirt, et cetera. And this veil is not very comfortable to sleep in. I've been to World East Day before and I've had to sleep in it outside. It doesn't, it's not the best. So um, we can, so when we're in our rooms, that is kind of also a sacred space. That's just for me and to be alone with God in my room. So. No one really sees me. I mean, my sisters, we, we, we're family. Like we can see each other without our veil. It's not a big deal. Um, but yeah, just to take it off to go to bed, get comfortable. Mm -hmm. Good question. 
Dominic, do you want to ask your question? Looks like you got your hand. Any brothers in your community? Brothers. So, so um, a religious community, so a religious community of sisters is a community just for women. But there are um, communities that follow a similar way of life that are just for men. So they have brothers. So, um, so there are communities of Franciscans. So they might be Franciscan friars, if you've heard that word. So there, um, we actually have two Franciscan friars who live on our, at a rectory that's on our property close to our mother house. And those friars, they're brothers. There's two of them, and they'll come over to our house and celebrate mass. So they're not technically part of our community the way my sisters are, but they're kind of like they're still kind of like in the Franciscan family, if you if you will. Um, so follow a similar spirituality, but we're not all like the same same single family. If that makes sense. Gabby and Sammy have some questions about your Franciscan family too. Um, they want to know how many sisters are there and can you tell us some of their names? Wow, good question. Um, yeah, so we have about 90 sisters total. So I do know all of the sisters, but it would take me probably a really long time to list all of their names, but I'll just list a, list a few. So um, sister I spend a lot of time with, she, we work and live together. Her name is Sister Regina. Uh, one of our novices, her name is Sister Solana for Solana's Casey. That was a pretty cool name. We also have a sister, Mary Francis. She's our newest sister. Um, we have a sister, Anna Joseph. We have a sister, Mary Joseph. Uh, we have a sister, Petra for Peter. We have a sister, Anna Marie. Sister Lois. Her name day was yesterday for St. Louis. Um... Sister Benedicta, Sister Lisetta, that's a fun name. That's uh, kind of like Elizabeth, but German, I guess, Lisetta. Um, I could go on, but those are those are a few of them. We actually have little prayer books that have all of the names of the sisters in it so that we can pray for our sisters by name. Your, your sister Fiat is our old babysitter. Oh yeah, Sister Fiat, she's great. She's actually away on a vocation trip right now. Mm. Yeah. Yes, Lord, you were a newborn. You were a little baby, and she and the babies that you and now she's sister Fiat in the same. Mm -hmm. She's my sister. It's pretty great. <laughs> um, do you go to mass every day, sister? Do your sisters go to mass every day in addition to the time that you spend in the Blessed Sacrament Chapel? Yeah, so we are blessed. Um, at the Mother House, we have mass celebrated in our chapel every single day, and then if the sisters are at a smaller convent away from the Mother House they will either have mass in their chapel or go to a nearby parish or hospital chapel for mass every single day. How many different convents do you have? We have, let's see, four of well, the mother house, which there's a few buildings at the mother house, but mother house, um, a convent in Fort Wayne, Indiana, convent in Indianapolis, Indiana, convent in uh, Lafayette, Indiana, and a convent in Dyer, Indiana. So I guess that's five total. Do sisters stay in the same convent their whole lives? Or do you move around to different convents in the midst of your vocation? We move around periodically. So it, it kind of, it just depends. There's not any like set time that you stay somewhere, but you, but yes, our sisters, that's part of our obedience. We might be asked to move to a different apostolate or a different con uh, community. So that'll happen. Our time is winding down. So if anyone has any one last burning question, maybe. Oh, here's a great one um, from the Farrell family. Beatrice wants to know what your convent is like. Oh, good, good question, question, Beatrice. Um, so our convent is, I think you might think it's really big. So it is pretty big. It was built when we had 500 sisters. Um, there's long hallways, lots of religious art, everywhere so that so we have long hallways and religious art everywhere so that when we're going from place to place we can spend time and think about Jesus and holy things um in the very middle of our comment is where our chapel is and then on the second floor of our comment that's where all of the sisters bedrooms are so we kind of have we each have our own bedroom and we usually have a sink in our bedroom just so we can get ready for to, for um 
our church. And then we kind of usually share kind of like a, a college dorm, you know, you share shower rooms and, and bathrooms, that sort of thing. Um, what else? We have a very large dining room. So we all can be in the same room while we eat together. Um, what else? Parts of our convent are actually pretty old. So the original part of our convent was built in the early 1900s. So that looks a little different than all the other parts. So that's pretty, pretty cool. We also want to know how old is your order? You said that there were more sisters then and that it was built a long time ago, but when did it start? Our community was founded in 1863 in Germany. So we've been around for over 150 years. Yeah, we've had a lot of sisters over that period of time. <laughs> Gabby, do you want to take yourself off mute and turn your mic on? And maybe you'll be our last question before we pray. Ooh. Um, what you said there were like paintings in the hallways. Which one's your like your favorite painting? Ooh, good question. Um, there's one. Um one of the sacred heart that I really like. Um, it has kind of like a darker background to it. Um, and it actually was the painting. I lived in one of the rooms for like seven years. So I'd always come down the same, um, the same stairs all the time. And we don't have roommates, by the way, to answer your question. Um, but so every day when I would go out to the first floor, this picture of the sacred heart was there. So I just loved, um, you know, that Jesus would like greet me in the, in the morning. Um, and then that's a, a special devotion for me too, the Sacred Heart. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's one last one from yeah. the from the boys in the Bart family. How old are the oldest and the youngest sisters? That's a great question. Oh, I think Sister Christine might be turning 102 pretty soon. So she is 101 years old. She is not the first sister of ours to turn 101, um, but she is, yes, pretty old. Um, and then our youngest sister, I think, is our novice. So she is, she's 24, I believe. Yeah, so yeah, 101 and 24. That's usually kind of the age span of our family. Yeah, that's funny to think about it like that, like a family. When you think how many years are between your oldest sibling and your youngest sibling, it's yeah. not like 60 years <laughs> right right <laughs> but that makes for a really cool family um sister would you mind closing us out um in prayer today so we want to yeah. um maybe all at, at our homes even with our mics off just give a little clapping for her <laughs> sister thank you for sharing your story and your vocation with us and your love for jesus um we love meeting brides of mm -hmm. jesus it's we love it. Um, so we thank you for your time and your story and wondered if you might um, lead us in prayer before we close out our morning. Certainly. And yeah, you are very welcome. And I appreciate the invitation and that you are taking time to, you know, find out. We all belong to one church and um, I think religious life and the priesthood is, um, is growing and we all kind of need each other. So I thank you also for your um, witness to me of your family. So thank you. And I'll be praying for you all as well. Um, so yeah, let's pray. Okay. In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit, teach us how to pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much uh, for coming as a man uh, to live and die for us, to be with us. Jesus, I ask uh, your special blessing on all gathered together. Jesus, asks that you be the special friend of our heart. Grant us your peace and your joy that we may rely on you for everything. And that our friendship with you may become uh, deeper and deeper every day. And Mother Mary, we entrust ourselves to you and to your intercession. So we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, 
Mother of God, Amen. pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Great. Praise Thank be you. Jesus Christ. Thank you guys so much for coming today. And